place we're sitting today anyway uh, here. Uh, we had some fun this week. All of us did. Amen. How many of you had water, electricity at some time or other not work this week? Almost everybody. Some of you live in this nice little section on this side of the church that's hooked into Baylor Trophy Club Hospital. So you're on the good grid, I think. But some of us are on the other side, Amy and I went without power for about 12 hours on Monday and that house got down in the low 40s and uh, Ron and Barb called to check on us and said, how are y'all doing? So I just had Amy send a picture of me with blankets wrapped around me, you know, a beanie on my head and all wrapped up. And he said, well, we have warm coffee. And Amy said, coffee, coffee, coffee. So we had it. They took good care of us. And Miss Teddy, we stayed with them for a while, but not nothing problem. Our water didn't free. It froze, but didn't bust any pipes and thankful for that. But we can't say that for the church building, our wonderful sprinkler system. I thank God in all things, you know. That sprinkler system's caused a lot of problems, and uh, but it out, is out over the portico, and we figured that would buzz. I was up here three or four times a day for a week trying to keep some heaters on it, but I was fighting a losing battle. And so I came up on Tuesday, and as I came by the lake over there, I noticed it was completely frozen. That's never happened before, so I had to get out and take a picture. So I got out and took a picture, and when I did, I looked over my camera and saw a fire truck in the parking lot. I said, that's not good. And when I got here, you know, I thought, well, we've lost the portico, the drive through entrance. We've lost it. And again, no big deal. We'll get through that. But then we came inside the church, and uh, one of the three-inch water lines going to feed that sprinkler system has a hole in it that I can almost get my fist in. And it flooded. It, within 10 minutes, the entire old building had two or three inches of water in it, all the way back to the offices. It broke down here, but all the way back to offices. And so we went to work. And... Um, uh, Dick and uh, Ron were up here sweeping water out. I wish I had a video I could show you today of us pushing the water out of the sanctuary. By the way, some of you might not know this, but in the front main entrance to our sanctuary, we used to have a real problem with the concrete there. It was always splitting and cracking, so we finally had somebody come in and paid them, dig it all out and do it right. And when they poured the concrete, we put a Bible in, in that concrete, open to Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. Matter of fact, that Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12 is still etched in the concrete right outside of the door there by the pillar. You can see it now. That Bible's open now. What's Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12? It's one of the great prophetic pictures in the Old Testament of the water coming out of the sanctuary of God and going out and going into the desert and filling the, the desert with new life. Yeah, it was supposed to be prophetic and poetical, not literal, you know. And uh, But it, I came around the building, water just... I mean, that'll make you day there when you see water rushing out of your sanctuary like that. I thought, oh boy. And uh, so uh, Terry had been uh, without power as I was, and so she went to stay with her son Trent up in Sherman. And so I called her, and I said, you got to help. And so it was wonderful that she was there. She was able to man the phones, get people lined up, and uh, she put it out on Facebook. Listen, folks, we had so many of you were here, 40, 50 people that were here that uh, you know came and helped us. We had mem church members, we had academy teachers and academy uh, uh, parents that were here. We had one neighbor just come in uh, that said, can we help? I said, absolutely. And uh, you know, we pushed all the water out. We got some people in here. We've, we've uh, contracted with a service called Unified Disaster Recovery and they are on it and we're way ahead of where everybody else is because it happened to us so fast and early in the week. And so uh, they're working hard on it. Right now, there's a big machine sitting out in front of the sanctuary called the Second, And it is very expensive, and it's very hard to get. And it is blowing air through a makeshift, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, duct work throughout our building. And uh, it is going to, they described it this way to me. They said it's a dehumidifier on steroids. And it's going to run for two weeks straight. I think it's been running since probably maybe Thursday. And uh, it's been, it'll be running for two weeks over there to do that. All of the, all the carpets in that entire building are out. Uh, many, like the sound booth that was in there, it's gone. We had to tear it down. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have to tear the stage out as well to get to the water that's underneath that area in the baptistry. And, uh, but we're going to have a brand new building over there uh, in so many ways. So you know what you're going to find out in the scripture here in just a minute? Every time the enemy tries to destroy you, God uses that to promote you. 
And uh, so it's going to be good. I mean, it really will. All this will come together. And uh, we got great people that work for us. We met with our insurance adjuster yesterday. Thank God for a great insurance company. They have always treated us well. And during this, they've stepped up, approved things. They put us on a thing called Code Blue, which basically put us into a position where we were able to um, uh, hire our own people quickly, and they approved it all immediately and uh, get them in here. So it's, uh, it's all good. Uh, we'll be here for a while. Uh, I told uh, the project manager, a uh, great uh, man named Ray, I told Ray, I said, Ray, I want to be in here on Easter Sunday. Now that's six weeks away. I think we'll make it before then. But uh, I told him, I want to be in here. I should have told him the week before. You know how deadlines are with contractors. But uh, I think we'll, we'll definitely be able to celebrate. And I want to declare something here today. While we were singing a minute ago, the Lord just really spoke in my heart that said, you need to declare today that the moment we walk back into a new sanctuary, in that sense, it's a new day. We're coming out of a year of COVID. We're coming out of the ice apocalypse storm of the century in Texas, you know. And this is going to be, a, it's, it's much more than new carpet, folks. God says it's a new day, a new day of opportunity, a new day of ministry, a new day of power, a new day of, of people's lives being touched. And so, praise God. Do you agree with that? Say amen. We're going to celebrate that. We're going to pray our hearts, and we're going to, we're going to see that come to pass. I, I love it when the Lord so clearly speaks and uh, communicates that type of revelation to us. So pray for us this week. Our Trophy Lakes Academy has some challenges. When all the people showed up to help, I just started. Who was hurting this week? And God, there's a community out here who needs some hope and who needs to see that there is hope for what comes alive. It can be so overwhelming what we've faced. But God, we've got you and we look to you as our strength. We look to you as the one who provides for us. Lord, we don't look to the insurance companies and we don't look to the, to the state and we don't look to all that. Lord, we look to you. We look to you who comes life. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for every storm that we've weathered. We thank you because we know great victories are coming from it. We can't wait to see what you do. And, Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your word even more so that we can go forth and share your glory. For it's in your most precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, take your Bible and look at Daniel chapter 3 with me this morning. Uh, for a brief time of getting in the Word today. I, I'm assuming the camera is not working uh, back there. It is or it isn't. I don't know. I hope, uh, are you having to hold that the whole time? Uh, okay, all right, there we go. So we're recording back there and we have a live stream there. So those of you joining us by live stream, uh, we've had a, a little, uh, if you didn't catch all of my talk there, we had a, a little problem with some uh, uh pipes and our sprinkler system that broke and we were moved into the gym for our worship service today so it may look a little different and I say the same thing for those that have watched this on YouTube uh, sometime later and say what in the world is that background and uh, we're going to have this background for a while you know it's amazing to me I'm one of my mysteries in life all of my ministry we will get things ready to work for Sunday we'll work on Saturday we'll make it work well everything's plugged in all the sound everything's working We'll come in on Sunday morning. We'll check it. It'll all work. It'll all work perfect. But right when we go live, it'll quit working. You know, I mean, it's sound equipment's done that through the years, TV equipment, everything. It seems like it does that, but we're going to keep moving, moving on. I want to just take a short time this morning. I'd really love for our praise team to come back and lead us in a little bit of worship before we leave here again today. But this is one of those passages I come to today in Daniel 3 where we could preach. Uh, Daniel 3 is one of those high points in the whole scripture of uh, the uh, a moment of faith declared and faith realized. I mean, you have, uh, you know, Abraham and Sarah having a baby as a senior adult. You have the Red Sea parting for the children of Israel. You have Elijah on Mount Carmel calling down the fire of God when he stood alone against all the prophets of Baal. And then you come to this passage in Daniel. And it's the story of Nebuchadnezzar, who was unlike most of the kings in that time. The king that's going to take over Babylon is a king by the name of Cyrus of Persia. Cyrus was a great leader. 
Every place that he took over, he let them keep their religion and keep doing what they were uh, uh, about and what they were uh, doing to, uh, in their religion or in their traditions, as long as they paid taxes. And then later, the Roman Empire would do the same thing. Let them do it. Well, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't one of those people. Nebuchadnezzar was one who said, you're going to worship, you're going to worship me. It's going to be all about me. And he was a brutal dictator and monarch of the Babylonian Empire. And so when he is in charge, he does these type of things. Daniel 3 tells us he erected a 90-foot statue and called everybody in. In his terminology, or in our terminology, he called the president, he called the governors, he called the senators, he called the congressmen, he called the mayors, he called everybody together and put them in a place that, listen, when the music sounds, I want everybody to bow down to this gold statue of me. Well, you know the three Hebrew children could not do that. And so they didn't do that. And you know, how many of you know the devil's a tattletale? He tells on you and tries to get you in trouble. So the devil got it stirred up, and they went to Nebuchadnezzar and said, hey, these Hebrew guys, they're not bowing down to your, to your statue. And so Nebuchadnezzar was enraged with a derangement syndrome that didn't make sense. It was just out of control that they were not doing that. He called them together. I love what he says when he calls them together. He said, is it true that you won't bow down? Every believer is going to face a circumstance like that somewhere in your life. If you're going to live for God, and if you're going to be a casual, comfortable Christian in name only, and it never affects your life, you're not going to have that. But if you truly embrace your faith, there's going to be a time when someone's going to look at you and say, is it true about you, what I've heard, that you, know, you go to church, that you're a Christian, that you serve God? Is it true? That you believe that, that, that God came to earth and became a man and died on a cross and was raised again from the dead and all of these things. Is it true? Somebody's going to ask you that somewhere along. And he asked them and they said, it's true. And I'm going to pick up and reading here when uh, Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 15, he says, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? He's about to find out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was their new Babylonian names, answered and said to the king, listen to this statement of faith, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, verse 18, let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury as a result of that, commands them to make the furnace hotter than it's ever been. The men that are making it hot and are going to take the three Hebrew children up there die because of the intense heat. But they throw the bound three Hebrew children in and they're alive in it. As a matter of fact, Nebuchadnezzar peers in and says, wait a minute, we put three in there, and I see a fourth man. I see one like unto the Son of God that is in there. He went to the fire and called the three Hebrew children out. They came out, and it's the most marvelous thing. Verse 27 says, their bodies, the fire had no power. They were, they were the original unburnt ones. They, the, power, the, the fire had no power over them, get this, nor was the hair of their head, not one hair, was singed. And also it says that their garments were not affected and the smell of fire was not on them. They walked out of that thing. The only thing that burnt on them was the bondage that they had wrapped them in and throw them in there. Some people say, I wish I could know the presence of God. Listen, sometimes there is a part of experiencing of God that only comes when you are faced with a fiery situation like this of great intense trial. It's in that that you meet Christ in ways that are uh, above and beyond ways and just the normal course of events that we come across. So they're set free. Nebuchadnezzar says, you have the real God. Your God is greater than me. What do we learn uh, about that uh, when we look at it? There's a couple of things i just point out real quickly. Because we've, you know, like I say, I would love to just preach on that. Because you can preach, walk upside down, and get your hair on fire, and run around and everything else. Because that thing just preaches. That story preaches, you know. You just read it, and you get excited. You get filled with faith just reading the story that is there before us. But really what I want to do just in our few moments is look at what we've been talking about and how this fits in the unfolding revelation that we're seeking from God. 
And what is that? That we recognize Babylon's not just an empire that came and went in history. Babylon is connected to Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, and it's connected as well to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, when Babylon is looked upon as that that last world power that unifies against God. So every time Babylon shows up, and especially in the actual kingdom that we have here before us, we find that it is a pattern for all times in history when the demons assemble in people to build something apart from God. Every time that happens, it's that Babylonian spirit. I want you to understand something. People die. Demons don't die. Demons, they just transfer from one generation. That's why in the book of Revelation, it talks about the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel died way back in Elijah's day. But the spirits that controlled her were still operating. And so we look in there, we want to learn, what is it about Babylon that tries to set a blueprint over the people of God to get us to conform to its ways? so that we'll surrender being the people of God, because we're living in that today. Every area you name today that we live in, Babylon's in charge. They're in charge of the arts. They're in charge of culture. They're in charge of media. They're in charge of government. They're in charge of every area of our life. People are there. And listen, you need to understand, I'm, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not men. We're talking about spiritual powers and authorities that are seeking to exterminate the people of God. And to always rile up that system against us to try to get us to conform to its image and gets enraged when we choose not to. So we got to learn from this. This is what we live in. If we're going to be the people of God, we need to come to the book and open it up and learn these truths about it. What did, what did Nebuchadnezzar do here? Here's what the spirit of Babylon always does. First of all, it seeks to unify all religions. There's a word for that. It's called ecumenicalism. Now, ecumenicalism could be something good if there's walls that separate us that shouldn't separate us. In other words, if somebody is a a brother and sister in Christ and they just believe we ought to baptize a little different than the way we do, you know, I could still fellowship with them. We ought not have unnecessary walls between these issues that are beyond the fundamentals of the faith. But most of the time, ecumenicalism means let's all compromise and come to the center. I mean, ecumenicalism is that Methodist pastor who opened up this latest session of Congress and prayed to the Hindu God and prayed to Allah and prayed to Jesus and prayed to everybody to say, like, I just you know, want to be inclusive. That's compromise. Listen, folks, just put some fire in your brain. Everybody can't be correct. Somebody's wrong. I choose to believe God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. I stand on that. That's my belief. You know what? I can't accept another God, because he's the one true God. And so you have to kind of set those boundaries in life. Well, Babylon wants to blend all that together. Listen, in the end times, the Bible teaches us that the Antichrist, not just an Antichrist spirit, but a person that embodies the devil himself will come to power. And look at this, Rome, Rome will be the place where um, the, uh, the political power uh, will go forth and out. Uh, Babylon will be an economic power, and then they will actually conquer Jerusalem, build a temple, and the Antichrist will sit down in it, declare himself God, and that'll be the religious structure that they seek to take over. They're going to take over everything and amass it all in one effort to come against God. And we know at the end, God comes and by his own breath slays all of them, and it, and it doesn't end that way. But don't think that the spirit of this age is just happening. It's there because that's what it is. Humanism is something else he did. You know what he did? He wanted to make God out of a man. You know, he wanted to make an image of a man and say that's God. Humanism, again, could be a powerful thing. Humanism could be a good thing. You know, God created humanity. We have incredible skills. I mean, we have incredible ability to invent things and and to prosper in technology and all this. It's incredible what humanity has been able to do. But when we take God out of the equation and make humanity the end of it all, then it becomes a humanism in which we are making man God. And that's exactly what happened from the very beginning. That's what the Babylon blueprint is all about. But he goes further than that. He don't want to just make a God, uh, you know, a man a God. He wants to be that God himself. He, He said, that's an image of me. And you're bowing down to me. As he looked and taunted the three Hebrew children, he said, what kind of God can deliver you out of my hands? I'm Nebuchadnezzar. I rule the world. Everybody does what I say. They say, not us. 
because you've gone too far. We'll obey you in things that we need to obey you in, but we're not going to obey you in bowing down for this. And so what is this? That's false worship. He went beyond making a God out of a man to making himself God. This clarifies what the real issue. Here it is. That's the ultimate issue of the whole universe. Satan comes as a slithering serpent in the Garden of Eden and starts getting us to deny or to doubt God's Word. Half God said, you'll die if you eat of this. He just knows you'll be like him. Come my way. Guess what? All the graveyards you pass will tell you that the devil's a liar and God tells the truth. And so what, 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 what is the issue in your life, my life? A simple issue. Who are you going to worship? Now, if your idea of worship is Sunday morning, and Sunday morning only being uh, in a, a worship service for 30 minutes or an hour on Sunday morning, then you're not uh, uh, you know, going to be able to, uh, uh, be able to you know, understand what it means to fully give your life. We're talking about here the ultimate authority in your life. We're talking about the issues of, of uh, life and death. We're talking about the issues of, of everything. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to bow down to? So here's where many of us fall into a trap. We say, well, if I was called before a fiery furnace tomorrow, and they said, deny Jesus, or we're going to throw you in, I know I'd stand. It doesn't happen that way. You're going to make a decision tomorrow, maybe even today, and the next day, that's going to determine how you'll answer when you get into the big time and get there to that moment. It doesn't happen in that moment. It just doesn't get all black and white one day. It's a bunch of compromises along the way. And when you get there, you know, Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon on this passage a hundred years ago, and he said, here's some of the excuses they could have used to bow to that God. They could say, well, you know, we're in a strange land. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. They could have easily made that excuse, compromised. They could have said, well, you know, this is our job. I mean, we work for Nebuchadnezzar. So, you know, I don't want to bring my religion into my job, you know, and so therefore I need to just bow down, you know, and, and that'll be okay. We, we could say, you know, they could have said, you know, this is our chance to really advance. You know, Nebuchadnezzar's taking a liking to us. We're advancing. You know what? That We're going to throw our chances away to be something in this world. They could have said we're politically bound. We're under his leadership. They could have said, well, you know, we're not really called to disown God. We're just called to bow to this God, and that's not really the same thing. They could have said, well, everybody else is doing it. This is the kind of compromises we make. It, it, we could say, well, you know, it's only this one time. Well, we could do more good by living than dead. So I'm going to do what I have to do to stay alive. They, they could have said, you know, this is more than God could have ever expected of us. We've we got to compromise on this. Folks, I, you know, I don't know how to get this across, but this is the problem today with the church. We've compromised so much, we don't understand that, and we think that one day some black and white issue will be out there and we'll be able to do it. No, you won't. I mean, if you can't even go to church on Sunday, how do you think you're going to stand against the power of a Babylonian system that commands you to fall to the ground or we're going to kill you? It's the little choices every day of our life that are building up to those big ones. You know, what are we doing today? When are we going to recognize that? When are we going to come to that place in our life where we recognize that it's every day? It's the little things I compromise on that begins that. We know that's how sin enters our life. No man ever walks out and says, you know, I think I'm going to become a person addicted to drugs. You know, I think, I, I think that's a good career choice. I'm going to do that. Nobody does that. Everybody just takes a little bit of compromise and a little bit of compromise, and a little more of compromise, and then they find themselves in that trap. No one ever says, you know, I think I'll, I'll cheat on my spouse. I think that'd be a good, good choice to go that way in my life. You don't ever just walk out one day and decide to do that. It's those little compromises along the way. And those little compromises lead you to the place where you're susceptible to the ultimate compromise in your life. We have to learn that from these people. Put that in our heart. I, I don't know how. I, I, I feel like sometimes, guys, that I'm up here just blowing a trumpet that nobody hears. The days aren't coming when we need this. They're already here. We need a church that has settled the issue that Jesus is Lord. If He's Lord, that changes everything in my life. Everything. So well, how, do you, how do you get to that? I'll tell you one how, way you get to that. You find your direction from this revelation of God in these 66 books known as the Holy Bible, uniquely inspired to give us truth. 
How many of you would understand this? Now, Daniel was what? During the time when the people of God were in captivity. So we're talking around, you know, 586 to 530 B.C., somewhere 500 years before Christ. Most of the Old Testament had been put together by then. Some of the later prophets will come after the exile will still come later, but they got a lot of Bible at that time. Would you believe that they knew the Scripture and God had promised them they wouldn't be burned? Listen to what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. We sing that today. And then he said, because you're mine, when you pass through the waters, hallelujah, praise God, I will be with you. And when you go through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. Listen to this. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. I guarantee you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked in there quoting that scripture. As they walked in and said, God, you promised this. We're standing on this promise. And I love what they said. But if God in His sovereign will chooses to operate another way, that's okay. It's not our life. It's His life that He has redeemed us with. And I don't care whether God chooses to save me or He doesn't choose me. I will not bow down to another God. Now, it'd be simple if I put a statue up out here in the Trophy Club Square and we said, let's all go down and bow down to it. But what about the compromises we have in life where we make a God out of athletics, where we make a God out of entertainment, where we make a God out of our pleasure, where we make a God out of all these idols that we have in our life. John Calvin said the human heart is a veritable factory of idols. There's always something trying to get in the way of God. And you and I need to respond to a new call from the Holy Spirit to come to a level of discernment that is greater than we've ever had so that He is teaching us, speaking to us, and we're learning along the way. Don't be careful. That's a compromise. That's a compromise. People say, oh, I, would, I wouldn't do that. But then they don't ever come to church because, well, you know, Junior's got baseball. And, you know, we got soccer, and we've got this. I, I want to tell you something. This is tough, but listen. Some people make a God of their family. You say, we're supposed to take care of our family. I love my family. Do anything for them. I'd die for my family. You know, I would in a heartbeat. But listen, they're not going to come between me and my relationship with God. I, I'm actually the dad in our home, the father in our home. I'm going to sit. We go to church. We go to church. We don't go to church because I'm a pastor. We go to church. When I wasn't a pastor, we went to church. We go to church. Why don't we go to church? Because God's called us to go to church. You say, yeah, but church is church. I'm going to tell you something. I'm tired of blaming everything on the local church. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of everybody saying how bad it is. Listen, Amy and I have been a member of a lot of churches in our ministry. Some of them I've been pastor of, some of them I'm not. And I'm going to tell you what, every church I've ever been a member of, I've been disappointed in. You know why? Because there's human beings in it just like me. And we disappoint one another. But you know what? I still show up to serve. I still show up to worship. I still show up to love God and, and help people. You know what? You're going to be disappointing me at some point. I'm going to be disappointing you at some point. But you know what? We keep worshiping God. We don't give up just because, oh, well, the church is just not what it ought to be. I mean, quit picking on the church. I got on this last week or whatever. I'm, I'm about to preach up here this morning. I get all, all this stuff. But somebody said, I, I'm not going to that church. They don't care about people. And the very person that said that, I, I wanted to say, I didn't. But I wanted to say, can I have the rent payments back that we paid for you when you didn't have a job? Could you just give that money back since we're so bad? Well, what about the time I came and jumped your car off and you didn't have any way to get to work and I gave you my car to, to, to be used during that time? Could, could you give some of that back since we're so evil? But I'm not like that. I'm a Christian, so I just took it and laid it down, you know. I didn't say it, but I did think it. Like Junior Hill, one of my favorite evangelists, Godly man, godly man. He was in a situation one time. He got so mad because the plane messed up and he wasn't going to be able to get home for his wife's surgery. And he told us when he was telling the story, he said, Now, I didn't cuss, but I wrote a word down and put it in my pocket. <laughs> That's the only bad thing you do. You're doing great in this life. Amen. Now, listen, the truth is this. It's time to quit picking on everybody. But we, we, listen, it's not, it's, it's about God. It's not about us. And it's not about. The local church, it's about what God can do and will do in our lives. You know, he had a clear confession here, and this is what I was going to preach, and I've got all everywhere, and I don't even know what time it is. Uh, we get to this point, though, where he said this. He said, our God is able. 
Because our God is able, I have a conduct in life that helps me overcome the fears and the peers that I have and everything else that tries to do it. My God is able. My God is able. You know, that's what I mean by worshiping God and Him only. He has proven Himself time and time again. There have been times when I've lived in the mystery of His will. When He didn't do what I asked Him to do, and it looked in my eyesight like that was the right thing to do, and He didn't do it, and I have to choose to trust Him, even though it doesn't make sense. Like Job who said, though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. Though it appears like He's just knocking my feet out from under me just to have a good time, I still will trust Him. There's been times like that. I'm not going to say I got it all figured out. God's bigger than me, and His ways are higher than mine, and His thoughts are deeper than mine, and I know that, and I love that about Him. And sometimes I tell Him, God, it sure looks like you don't know what you're doing, but I know you do know what you're doing, and I trust you, even when I can't understand it with my little brain, what's happening. So we we get that settled in our life, and we know that that's true, because why? Our God is able. Our God is able. I saw something this morning on on Twitter or something, I, I saw, trying not to read that stuff on Sunday morning, but I was looking, trying to post something about inviting people to church on all the different platforms. And uh, I saw something on there that today marks the, I think it's the 76th anniversary of the death of a man by the name of er- Eric Liddell. Some of you that uh, are younger might not know about Eric Liddell. He, he died in 1945, but the 1923 Olympics, he was favored to win the gold medal, and his, the best race he ran at that time was the either 100-yard or 100 meter, whatever it was at that time. But guess what? They scheduled the race or the time trials to lead up. He would easily was going to win these and get in the final. But when they scheduled the heats, one of them was on Sunday. And Eric Liddell had decided a long time ago in his life that Jesus was Lord and he was going to dedicate the Lord's Day for him wasn't a legalistic thing to him. It was the fact that God's, I'm never going to let anything incur upon my ability to worship God on the Lord's day. Can you imagine that kind of conviction in our world? Can you imagine? And so you know what he did? He told them, I'm not running in it. They said, you'll be disqualified. You won't be able to get the gold medal. He said, I don't care about gold medals. I care about pleasing my God. And I don't run on Sunday. He ran in another race that he wasn't as favored in, and he ended up winning it and getting a gold medal in another race that didn't practice on Sundays. But what conviction. They made a movie out of it, won an Academy Award called Chariots of Fire, told the story about it. But later in his life, after that, he left. He didn't go on a worldwide tour and write a book and make millions. He went to China as a missionary, just like his mom and dad. And in the late 40s, late uh, late. 30s, I should say, early 40s, China was a very difficult place to be in. They had been war-torn, and there was so much destruction, and he gave his life to ministering to those people. If he had been in England, he would have had proper medical care and could have lived longer, but because he was giving his life there, he, he uh, didn't have that medical care, and he died 76 years ago today. He died. What a man of conviction. I'm not going to run that race. Well, God would understand. He gifted you. God would, I don't care. I've told God he's number one, and part of that number one is I worship on Sunday. Mm. Wow. 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 What conviction there is in that. You know, I've said I'd end this thing with saying that what the devil sent to defeat them ends up promoting them, and they come out of this thing. What I call you today is just a surrender to new correction. By the way, I did read this about Eric Liddell. When he finally died... He was in the hospital, what little hospital they had there, and a guy was trying to help get him some help on something with a book or something, and he started trying to say the word surrender, and he couldn't get it out. And so two times he said, Sur- Sur-, and then he fell back on his pillow and he was gone. Surrender. Surrender. He couldn't get it out, but he sure lived a life that was full of that, surrendering his life to the purposes of Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, there's a new day coming. It's going to require a whole new level. Uh, of that. And you say, it's coming. No, the, whole, the day's here. We live in Babylon. Are we going to just go with the flow? Are we just going to do everything the world does? Or are we going to stand for the truth that is in the Scriptures and let it, God capture our heart in such a way that we say, you're ours, Lord. You're ours, Lord. And we're yours. And you have loved us with a love that is incredible. And we surrender our life to you and worship you in that way. And I call you, this is not a religious commitment I call you to. It's a call to fall further and deeper in love with Jesus Christ. 
in a relationship with him that, you know, when he's standing next to you and somebody says, hey, let's do this, and you think, if he's standing there, it makes it altogether different than if you memorize some rules of what people might think of you for doing something. If you're in a relationship with him and you love him, it becomes about not wanting to disappoint him, not about a bunch of rules. It comes about living in a way that's pleasing and brings glory to his name. Amen. Let's pray together today. I was all over the place. I didn't even look at many notes that I had or anything today. But I just want us to continue in this, but I don't want to lose the flow of what I believe the revelation that God is giving us as a church through this time. And what we can all stand and say today with great conviction, our God is able. Our God is able. I'm going to let the praise team come up if they will and if they could then pull one of their songs out that they had or whatever just let's just worship for a moment before we leave i'm going to stand right down here on the front if somebody needs prayer today about anything that's going on in your life i want to stand here and pray for you uh today and during this time while we're singing you feel the freedom let's just get comfortable in our corner over here okay so feel comfortable today if god speak into your heart i'll be glad to minister and pray uh, for you today. Let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, I bow my head to you today. And I pray that, Lord, today we will be surrendered uh, to you in, in a way that truly reflects the worship that we have given to you. Father, I, I pray that, Lord, you would be blessed to make your presence manifest to us here today. Lord, we ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up together.